Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning worship service for Sunday, April 18th, 2021. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our call to worship this morning will be done by Lily. We come from many places and many backgrounds. We come with a desire for greater understanding. We come to hear the words of scripture. We come seeking companions in the faith. We come to discover the one revealed in the breaking of the bread. We come to grow as disciples of Christ. Come, let us worship God, may known in Christ Jesus. Let's join together in our opening hymn, Thine Be the Glory, number 258. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, when we are frightened, when we're filled with doubts, open us to the gospel of peace. When we think we understand everything and our minds are closed to new teachings, open us to your knowledge. When we do not understand what's happening in our world and our fears turn into anger or mistrust, Open us to your infinite patience. When we want to hide behind laws and regulations and traditions that can hurt and exclude, open us to your reassurance and your love. As a risen Christ came to be with the disciples and show them new possibilities, open us to the possibilities that we can't see with our eyes, but only with our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel that is shared with us again and again. God loves us and cares for us. God forgives us. And then God sends us into the world that surrounds us and says, go and do the same. Love this world. Care for this world. Forgive those who hurt you and forgive yourself as well. This is the good news of the gospel. Life can begin anew. And for that gift, we give thanks. Amen. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walked before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let's join together in singing, Come to Us, Beloved Stranger, number 262. Good morning. Welcome to Children's Time. I can't show you my snow pea plants this week because I've planted them out in the garden now. So I'm looking forward to them growing and giving us snow peas sometime in the late spring or early summer. 
Luckily, they're called snow peas because they can handle some colder weather. So if it gets cold again, they should be okay. But maybe I'll bring you a picture sometime of what they look like in the garden. I was thinking about our celebration time this week as well, and remembering all the celebrations we used to share here in the church, and we'll be able to share again sometime before too, too long, I hope. But I remember people sharing celebrations about birthdays and celebrations about wedding anniversaries um, and so many different celebrations about everything that's good happening in our lives. And so I'm going to put in a coin uh, just remembering all of the great celebrations we've shared inside this church building, the way we've shared them with each other as a community. And that made me think about the scripture reading that we have for this morning as well. The scripture reading is about the story of the disciples after Jesus' death and resurrection on the road to Emmaus. So they're going home after their time in Jerusalem, after Jesus' death and resurrection, and they're not sure what to do with their lives. They're not sure what to think about what happened to Jesus. And while they're walking along, Jesus comes to them, and Jesus asks them to tell tell him their story. So they tell the story about Jesus' life and death and resurrection, not knowing this is Jesus that they're talking to. And it's made me think about how in telling stories and sharing stories with each other, we begin to understand God's God in our lives and the way God has affected our lives. So in our celebrations in the morning when we share those here at church, um, that's part of how God is active in our lives. We give thanks to God for birthdays and other celebrations. And the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they, they were so overjoyed when they discovered that it was Jesus who was with them, that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and that Jesus was still with them. And so we have these stories that we share with each other, and as we share the stories, they all become one great big story. And that's the story of God and God's love for our lives. Let's have a prayer together. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus' life. We thank you for all the stories, the stories about Jesus and the stories about our lives. Help us to share those stories and to see the way they're all part of your plan in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go now in peace. The Gospel reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other? with each other while you walk along. They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, They came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, 
and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, the thoughts, the meditations of all of our hearts, wherever we are, may they be acceptable to you, our God and our guide and our companion on the road. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So who is Jesus? That's a question that's been on people's minds since even before Jesus was born. Before he was born, people wondered, what's the Messiah going to be like? Who is going to be the Messiah? And then after Jesus was born, after Jesus began his ministry, people were saying, who is this man who dares to challenge the religious authorities and the religious traditions? Who is Jesus of Nazareth really? People asked after he died, after he rose again. And for the last 2,000 years, who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Who was he? How can we ever know the real Jesus? How can we ever know who Jesus was and is? I say this because I believe that there is no such thing as accurate factual history. I was a history major in university, at least for a short time, between wanting to be an architect and actually being a truck driver and then eventually getting my degree in world religions. But I was a history major for a brief time. And I was convinced then, and I'm convinced now, that there's no such thing as history, at least not factual history. This may sound a bit negative or a little bit bleak, but think about it for a moment. Once an event has taken place, We never really know what happened because all we have is someone's interpretation of the event. Whether it be with ancient history or biblical times or something that just happened last week, we never know what really happened. 
I've often heard people say, if only there were newspapers, if only there were TV crews back in biblical times, then we would have an unbiased historical account of what really happened. Really? If it was a newspaper, which newspaper? The Ottawa Citizen? The Globe and Mail? The Ottawa Sun? The Stittsville and Richmond Community Voice? Or if it was a TV station recording the events of Jesus' life? CBC? CTV? CNN? Fox News? Would they record the events in the same way? I think the last few years have taught us that it's difficult to get through our own biases. Of course, I've not mentioned the way people actually get their news now, through Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or Twitter. Imagine if there were people tweeting back in Jesus' day. Whose Twitter feed would you want to follow? Peter? Or James? Or John? Would Jesus have his own Twitter account? What about Mary Magdalene? What about Mary or Martha? What about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Would there be an official temple Twitter account or Herod's Twitter account or maybe the beloved disciple? At wedding with Jesus, just turned water into wine, smiley face, wine glass, cheers, OMG. I won't even get started on TikTok. Whether we get our news and information, wherever we get it from, anything about any kind of recorded event in history is always an interpretation from the perspective of the author, which is influenced by background and by culture, which is also influenced by specific times in which the person lived, and also by what they wanted to communicate or convince you about. That does not mean that all sources, though, are of equal value and that all sources are equally accurate. Clearly, some are more biased than others, and some more clearly have an agenda than others. Have you ever thought about as well the fact that all of ancient history especially, but even today the majority of people recording history are well-off and educated people? In what way is this an accurate representation of life when the majority of the world's population is undereducated and poor? Where is their voice? Not to mention that most of history was generally written by men. In any situation, history was written by the victors, by the people who won in battles, because the people who lost in the battles, their history could be destroyed. We all see different things. We all remember different things. We're all influenced by different ideas. Even the Gospels. Each of the Gospel writers remember Jesus' life a little bit differently. And they're all writing with a specific purpose in mind. And yet they're all telling the same story. All of the Gospels were right, but they were all coming from different perspectives too. All history, all memories are an interpretation of the past. All memories we have are an interpretation of our past as well. So what are the tools that we use to interpret the past? How do we use our memories and how do we put them together? John Calvin, the 16th century reformer, once said that our scriptures are the lenses through which we see the world. Our scriptures are the lenses through which we see the world. If all our memories are an interpretation of the past, then the tools we use to help us interpret the past are pretty important. As we look back at any events in our lives, we can choose to see God in those events or we can choose to not see God's presence. What the scriptures do is help us to see that God has been at work each and every day in our lives. There is nothing new about this, by the way. In the gospel reading that we heard Beth read this morning, we see two disciples walking home from Jerusalem after Jesus' death. And what are they doing? They're going over the events of the last few days. They're remembering what happened, and they're sharing their two different perspectives with each other. By talking about it, by remembering together, they're forming a common memory of what's just happened. We're told that as they walked and talked about Jesus' life and death, Jesus became present in their midst. Think about that for a moment. 
As they talk about Jesus' life and death, Jesus becomes present in their midst. Jesus once said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there also. They don't recognize him, though. For one reason or another, we don't know exactly why that is. And believe me, we had a long conversation about this at Bible study. They don't recognize Jesus as he meets them on the road. He appears to be nothing more than just a fellow traveler along the way. As a fellow traveler, Jesus casually asks them what they've been talking about teasing them into retelling their story, and this time telling the story to a third person. It's also not one story they're telling, not their individual stories. They're telling the story that they've come up with together, the two stories they've got that have now melded together to be one. The two disciples can't believe that this stranger doesn't know what's been happening, so they tell him the whole story. By the way, have you ever noticed, too, that the story says very clearly that there were two disciples, but we only get the name of one of the disciples. I've said this before. When the stories in the Bible do that, there's usually a reason. Not naming the second disciple gives us an entry into the story as well. It's as though we are that unnamed disciple on the road as well. They replied, as in the two of them replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Interesting, that story gives us the facts. That is what happened, but where is God in that retelling of the story about Jesus' death and his new life? How does that story fit in with God's plan, God's actions in our world? So far, we have the life experiences of the disciples, but the interpretation of their memory is missing something. They need a lens through which to look at their experiences. I think that is where sometimes we fall short as well, partly because our lives get busy and we don't have time to reflect on our experiences, partly because we don't know our Bible stories as well as we might, and partly because we're not used to looking at our lives through the lens of scripture, as Calvin would put it, or looking for God's fingerprints on our lives, as other people have said. We have the memories. We remember things in our lives. But sometimes we have trouble seeing how God fits into it all. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus told Cleopas and the other unnamed disciple just exactly how it all fit together. Our text says, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. He showed the disciples, looking at his life through the lens of the Old Testament, the collected stories of God's interaction with God's people, how Jesus' life fit into God's bigger plan for the world. It's a little bit ironic that the two disciples on the road still didn't see Jesus in the stranger, even as he made this explanation. Jesus had become present in their midst, but they were unaware of him. Even with the interpretation of his life, the light in their heads is only beginning to go on dimly. There's another important element of this story of the road to Emmaus as well. The disciples do eventually recognize Jesus but they only recognize Jesus' presence in their lives when Jesus breaks bread with them, when he's present at the table with them. In this story, Jesus breaks the Jewish etiquette rules. He's the guest in another person's house, and yet he's the one who gives the blessing. He's the one who breaks the bread and shares the bread with these disciples. And it's in the word, the scriptures interpreted, and in the sacraments, communion in this case, that we come to know Jesus and that our eyes are wide open too. That's what Jesus did with the disciples along the road. He interpreted their experiences through the scriptures. 
And then in breaking of bread and sharing the meal with them in communion, their eyes were opened. The first reaction of the disciples, though, when they realize that they have seen the risen Lord because Jesus has disappeared from their midst when they recognize him. They want to go back right away, though. They want to go back to Jerusalem, and it's dangerous to travel at night, but they can't stop themselves. They have to go back and tell their, the others because they have a new part to this story, this story that's not just theirs, but a story that belongs to all of Jesus' followers. This new part of the story needs to be shared with the others so the story can be more complete. They have seen a way that Jesus fits into God's bigger plan. They also see how Jesus has fit into their lives and become present with them in their time of need. Every event that happens, whether it's in the history of our world or in our own lives, these events are always interpreted by us as well. As we look back at events in our own lives, we can choose to see God in those events, or we can also choose to not see God in those events. The tools that we have for interpreting events in our lives are, are the Bible, the lens through which we see our lives, the sacraments of the church, through which we become even more aware of Jesus' presence in our midst, and the ability to share our stories with others. In sharing our stories with others, they all join together to form one story, the story of God's activity in our lives throughout history. I come back to the question from the beginning, who is Jesus? Jesus was the eternal word who was with God from the very beginning. Jesus was also a real-life human being who lived and moved on the earth. He taught a group of disciples. He healed those who were sick and gave them a glimpse of God long ago before dying at a young age. Jesus is also the eternal Son of God who through the Holy Spirit is still present with us and present whenever two or three are gathered together. Jesus was a great teacher. He was a wise leader. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus is still here with us as the body of Christ. May God open our eyes to see God's presence through Bible stories, stories we have of other people's experiences, through the gift of grace that we call communion and baptism, and by blessing our lives with wisdom, the wisdom to take the time to look for God's hand at work in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, that you meet us where we are. Whether it's on a road, on a journey, or at home in our own homes, you're always near to us. As we look at our lives and our experiences, may we see you in those experiences. May we see your fingerprints on our lives as you have guided and directed us and nudged us throughout our lives. As we gather, we think of those in need from our own church family, from our own families, and those from around the world who are in need. We pray in particular today for those who are going through surgeries, and procedures and treatments for cancer. We pray for those who are experiencing difficulties in life. We pray for your healing touch, O oh God. We pray in particular for those who struggle with anxiety and depression, for those who have mental health issues, for those for whom this stay-at-home order is more than just an inconvenience. We ask for your comfort and for your peace for them. We see the needs of our world as well, O oh God, and we pray for the leaders of our world. We pray for compassion and humility. We pray that you would work through different leaders in our world to make this into a better world. Help us to be channels of your peace, O oh God, in what we say and what we do. Now in silence, we bring to you those prayers that sit so deep inside us that we can't put them into words or we fear that words will be wrapped in tears and so in silence we bring you our prayers.
your spirit in this place. Oh, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us praise. Lord, listen to your children pray. Amen. Let's join together in our closing hymn, Lord Jesus, You Shall Be My Song, number 665. We've heard this morning about Jesus meeting the disciples on the road to Emmaus, how he traveled with them, how he shared stories with them, and when he broke bread, they could see who he was, and he made himself real in their presence. Jesus makes himself real in our presence as well, when we share stories together, when we break bread together, and Jesus walks with us on our roads. When I think about the story of the road to Emmaus, it makes me think of the Celtic blessing. And so let's hear those ancient words. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. 
and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Go now in peace. Amen.